Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. Welcome. I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, we've been in a series called Supporting Cast that I'm not going to recap the whole thing for you because we're like months into it now. Um, but it's online. It's beneficial. The, the goal behind it is to look at all of Scripture and realize who the hero is, the main character, that it's God. That's the story of God. And that everyone in the Bible, God has given us to help us have an understanding of um, humanity, the brokenness that we live in, um, but really to point us back to him. And so what we've been doing through this whole series is looking at the supporting cast members. If he's the hero, he's the main character. Let's look at some of the other large characters in scripture um, and see what we can learn about God, about ourselves. And really it's good for us to understand the, the whole big story of scripture. And, and so realizing that, um, you know, maybe you came up knowing some of these stories if you grew up in church, maybe you didn't grow up in church and so these stories are new for you. Either way, I think it's massively beneficial that we either relearn or learn these for the first time. And to be honest, a lot of us um, know these stories from a children's perspective because that's when we learned them. And so, you know, stories like Noah's Ark is like this fun little like, and all the animals got on the boat. And we don't talk about what happened outside of the boat. Where all humankind that was not on that boat was wiped out. And so um, we, we just want to make sure that we're uh, teaching it now uh, to adults, as adults, um, the way scripture says it. And... Uh, I've really enjoyed going through this. We've gone through several characters already. We're, we're talking about Moses now. Uh, maybe you've heard of Moses. Maybe you haven't. Uh, God's people, the nation of Israel, has come to Egypt during a time of famine and uh, been established there. God, with his providential hand, his sovereignty, has placed them in a place where they would be provided for during a broken and, and hard time in the world around them. Um, and, and so they're, they're brought to Egypt where there's resources. As time goes on... Um, and there's no longer a famine, Egypt and Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, realizes, man, there's a lot of these Israelites and they're growing really fast. Uh, I don't like that, that they're kind of gaining in power and in number. So let's oppress them. Um, let's try to kind of keep them under our thumb so that they won't fight against us. They won't have enough time or energy to continue to grow at this pace. But everything he does to oppress God's people, to persecute and, and make it hard for them, uh, backfires. God continues to provide for them and they grow and they thrive. Even under slavery and even under um, some, some calls to have the young men killed, uh, God continues to grow his people, care for his people. And, and then God sends a guy named Moses. We picked up the story as a, as a baby being born, that God uh, in his sovereignty um, takes care of him. When all the other young males are supposed to be getting thrown into the Nile and killed, that, that Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses, that he grows up. He's a Hebrew child growing up in, in Egypt royalty. That he, he ends up looking out for his own people. He has to leave because he kills someone and and God has this moment with him where he draws him to himself. There's the burning bush moment where God says, you're going to go do this work for me. I have a plan to save my people. I'm going to rescue them and you're going to do it. I'm going to work through you my plan to save my people. And, and Moses did what probably most of us would do is he, he, he has some pushback. He says, are you sure you got the right guy? Like, God, do you know who you're talking to right now? And I can't do that. What if they don't listen there's this awesome moment when he says, who are you? And God reveals who he is and his plan and his heart for his people. And finally, Moses um, gets on board and heads back to Egypt with his brother Aaron, who will speak for him. And, and they go back and the, the elders of Israel hear that God cares, that he listens, that, that he's got a plan. And they're excited and they bow down and worship God. 
And then it's time for Moses and Aaron to go before Pharaoh, the king, to let him know, hey, God says to let his people go so that they can go worship him. And Pharaoh's not having it. He, he tries to kind of mock them and, and show that their God doesn't have power, that, that his gods do, and his heart is hard. The Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. It says that God, God hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would keep pushing back against God so that God could show the strength of his mighty hand in, in saving his people so that everyone would know who God is, that he's the Lord above all. And so we got through last week the, the plagues, which was kind of heavy. I know that because of your responses on a Sunday morning. You know, if, if it's like an uplifting, like, yeah, 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 message, then people kind of respond a little better. When I'm talking about uh, God moving in ways to show his strength and his judgment against people that are evil and against him while he's saving his people out of that, um, it's just kind of heavy. And so I get that there wasn't a whole lot of like, rah, rah. But it was phenomenal because God saved his people. And in that exodus, he, he protects his own by the blood of a sacrificial lamb. That he protects them and that as they leave Egypt, he even provides for them through the Egyptians, gold, silver, clothes, everything that they would need on their journey. And so where we pick up this week, they've now left Egypt and they're on this road. They understand that God's called them from slavery and to the promise that he has for them of this beautiful place for themselves that they will glorify him. And now they're out of Egypt. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump into um, Exodus 13 if you have a Bible with you. If not, you can follow along with us on, uh, on the screen. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. God, you are amazing. God, I ask that you would move in this place, God, in, in massive and tangible ways, Lord, like we see here in, in our story today. God, where your hand moves. I ask that you would do that now, God. Move in our hearts, our minds, our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're taking notes, um, you know, it's Moses, kind of week three, but uh, today we're going to look at protection praise and provision. Protection, praise, and provision. Again, these might be some stories that you've heard before. Um, can I just tell you, it's never wrong to hear them again. Sometimes we can feel like I've heard that and we, and we, we dial down and we, we tune out. Um, we don't want to do that because the Bible is the breathed word of God. So it's alive and active which is awesome because that means I read through the same things over and over and God constantly is, is showing me different things in that word. And so um, I'm excited to get into this. If you've heard it, you can just kind of go with me and amen with me because uh, you know where we're headed. So under the title protection, we're going to look at the crossing of the Red Sea. It starts in Exodus 13. I'm going to read just a couple verses to start us and we're going to tell some of the story. But when Pharaoh let the people go, this is awesome. God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. God took them the long way instead of the short way to where they were headed. For God said, listen to this, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So if they instantly get out of here and they face confrontation and conflict, they might change their mind and want to go back. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. So he took them the long way. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. That's an interesting statement. Listen to what it just said. God takes them the long way because he said if they face war, they might change their minds and return back. But it says that they left there ready for battle. They seem to almost confront each other or conflict with each other, those statements even that, okay, they're ready for battle, but God says they're not ready for battle. So what that means is they have the tools they have what would be needed to go fight. But their heart isn't ready for that fight. That, that God provided all that they would need to go face an, a, another army. But when, when they showed up there, there would be other things that they haven't worked out. That would make them want to turn back and go back to Egypt. That's, that's good for us to kind of understand in our own lives. Because sometimes we have the tools necessary, but our heart and our perspective aren't right yet. Okay. 
you know, the interesting thing is that uh, it's better to have your heart and perspective right and not have the tools than it is to have the tools and not have your heart and your perspective right. Because if your heart, your passion, your perspective are right, you'll get the tools. If you're passionate about something, you really believe God's going to come through on something, you'll figure out what is needed and, and you'll believe that he'll provide everything that's necessary for what he's called you to because he always does. But if you have the tools and your heart's not right, what happens is you don't want to go in half-hearted, you'll die. You go into battle half-hearted, you die. And so he says, I'm going to take them the long way because even though this way is shorter, there, there's some things they'd have to fight there that they're not ready for yet. They don't understand really that, that I'm the one fighting for them and I'm the one pushing through. They're not on board with all that yet. So even though they have what is necessary um, tangibly, it's not ready yet in here. Okay. So they leave. God takes them the long way so that they don't have to face war right away. And the Bible says that Moses took Joseph's bones out of Egypt with them because Joseph... Um, before he died, many, many years ago, uh, had made the, the Israelite people make a promise. Don't leave me here. God is going to come back and fulfill his promises. He's faithful. He's going to save us from here and take us to our promise. Don't leave my bones here. And so they took the bones with them. And then the Bible says in 1321, by day the Lord went ahead of them and a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. This is awesome. God is continuing to show them, I'm with you and I'm leading you. I'm with you and I'm leading you. That during day or night, they could look up and see, we're not alone. God, our Lord, that saved us out of Egypt is still with us and he's leading us where we need to go. They needed that at that time. They were wrestling through stuff. It's one of the reasons they weren't ready for war, even though they had the stuff. They, their hearts weren't quite there. God continues to need to show them, I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm the one leading this thing. I'm your God, and I'm above all others. So in a cloud and in fire, and in the Old Testament, often you'll see God shown in those things. We saw the, the burning bush, and we see that the, the cloud will rest in places where God meets with Moses. So the Lord says to Moses to tell the Israelites, the people, to turn back, and camp near the Red Sea. So kind of turn back towards where you came from and, and go camp near the Red Sea. And Pharaoh will think that you're wandering and confused. And God says, I'll harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue you, pursue the, the Israelites. But I will gain glory for myself and they will know that I am the Lord. God says, listen, we, I, I did the plagues to show Egypt that I am mighty and that I am the Lord, that I am am who I am. I'm Yahweh. I'm the God of the Israelites. That I did those, those plagues so that they would let you go and, and they still are rebelling against me. They're still fighting against me and I'm going to prove once and for all that I am God and not to be reckoned with that way. And so the people come back and they camp. And the Bible says that Pharaoh, once he realized that the people had really left, he tells them to get out. Get your people, get out of here. Get your people and get out of here. These plagues are horrific. Once he realizes that, that they had left, we're talking 2 million people. We're talking 600,000 grown men doing slave labor in Egypt. They're a huge labor force to be reckoned with. And they all just got up and left in one day. So Pharaoh now is looking around and he goes like, this isn't good for us. Because not only have they left, also the firstborn have all died. So they've lost a lot of their own strength too. And so he says, like, this isn't good. We shouldn't have let them go. They're wandering. They're confused. We should go after them and make them come back. And so Pharaoh takes his army. He gets in his chariot. It says he has 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots and armies. He's got this massive, massive, powerful army. That he goes, okay, guys, we're going to go out to the Israelites. And so they, they do that. And when they catch up with the Israelites, they catch up to them when they're, they're by the Red Sea. And the Israelites look up and this massive army that they were just freed from bondage and slavery under um, is pursuing them. And they freak out. They're frightened. They cry out to God. And then they do something that they have a tendency to do over and over again in the Old Testament. Um, they cry out to God and then they blame their leader. 
(laughs) They turn on Moses. Moses, the dude that they just followed out of slavery, that God has already proven several times that he speaks to and that he's working through as their leader to save them. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? Like, oh, Egypt didn't have enough space for us to die, huh? So you brought us out here? What have you done to us? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert or in the wilderness. God already just said that they have what they need for battle. Not only that, he's proven himself already to be their God and to be the one that by his mighty hand, they are saved and they are set free. They see the Egyptians pursuing and now they're frightened. They're crying out to God and looking at Moses going, what have you done? We were just their servants there. Now they're going to come kill us. Okay. And here's Moses' answer. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Or your Bible might say, and I love it. Fear not. Stop fearing. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, will never, you will never see again. That's the truth. You're about to see that. The Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Man. Can I just say that, that we're going to see as we continue through this series, times where God very clearly says, get up and fight. There's also times where God says, stand down and watch me fight. Because I need to remind you again today that I'm the one in charge. It's my strength. It's by my mighty hand that you'll be set free. And so at this point, um, that's happening. And I think whatever you're going through right now, maybe continue to pray that out. If he's asking you to be active in something, don't stand still. But for some of us, we want to do things in our own strength. And it might be a word for you to stand still and watch God work. God continues to show that it's by his strength and his protection God tells Moses to raise his staff, stretch his hand over the sea, and that the waters will divide. And and the angel of God um, and the pillar of the cloud, instead of being in front of the people like it has been this whole time so far, it goes behind them. It goes between them and the Egyptian army, this big cloud, so that neither side wants to go to the other side because the thickness of this cloud. The Bible even says that the cloud provided light to one side and darkness to the other so that neither side wanted to go to the other side. Now think about that for a minute. If it only provided light to one side, then wouldn't the ones in the dark see the light and want to go over there? It provided light to one side and darkness to the other. So you wouldn't want to go into darkness. So as far as I can understand it, Both sides saw their side as like, we can see each other, but we can't see what's going on over there. So we're not going through the cloud. Did you hear that? Okay. That's miraculous. If you're wondering, that's awesome. So I see it as darkness, but you're in it and it's light and my side's darkness, but I'm in light. Moses stretched out his hands and the the waters divided. The Bible says that God blew this wind in that that separated the Red Sea um, so that There were walls of water on each side. That's a really strong wind. That it it pushes the sea back. And Israel went through on dry ground with the water. Think about that for a minute. Okay, whenever it's a water thing, I'm always stressed out because I don't swim well. (laughs) But, But God, this is a huge faith step for me. So, so they start walking through. And just imagine, I, I always just wonder, like, as you're walking through with all the people, God's doing this miraculous thing, the clouds behind you so that people aren't pursuing you yet, the, the, the walls of wa- water on the side, you're going through on dry ground. I always just wonder what a wall of water looks like. Do, does anybody else think that way? I always wonder, like, could you, like, see into it and see, like, animal or, like, fish and stuff? Or is it, like, anyway, um, 
So they're, they're walking through and there's these walls of water where the whole time you just have to believe God every single step. Like you're going to keep this like this all the way through. And, and so they pass through and now God allows Egypt to pursue them. And, and as they're pursuing them, the Bible says that God confused them and that God jammed the wheels of their chariots. They're going through chasing them and all of a sudden they're like, they catch flats on their chariots. <laughs> but like everybody does. And they're confused what's going on. And there's this awesome thing that happens when Egypt realizes like, "Uh uh-oh. They realize they're confused. They realize their chariots are having problems. And they make the statement, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them. It's too late though. They're in there, the, the water's on both sides of them. They're catching flats on their chariots. And they start looking at each other going like, we're in trouble, guys. Let's get away from them as fast as we can. Turn around. The Lord's fighting for them. They're doing nothing, and and we're having problems. The Lord told Moses to stretch his hand back out over the water so that the water would flow back, and the water flows back, covers the chariots, the horsemen, the entire army, so that no one survived. No one. Now listen to this. At the end of chapter 14, it says this. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the mighty hand. The people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. You're going to find out that this is an awesome thing, but it's a very short-lived thing. That they, in the moment, they, they see God's mighty hand just worked, and there's no way to explain what we just encountered and experienced other than God is more powerful than anything. And so it's this healthy fear of the power of God, yeah. uh, of going like, wow, he's big. And so they put their trust in him. God, you just saved us. Before, we were just crying out to you, and we were mad at Moses. And now we trust you, and it says that they even trusted Moses because they followed him through this and and they were saved. And so they did the proper response to seeing God move in a mighty way in their lives. Watch this. Chapter 15. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. They gave praise to God. They did the regular, reasonable response to seeing the grace and mercy and strength of God. Casey just said it a minute ago when he was up here praying after worship that, that the, the, the right response to seeing the, the might of God is praise. You know, some people wonder, um, and it doesn't talk about raising hands necessarily here, but we'll wonder, like, why, why do people raise their hands during worship? Um, and maybe that feels awkward for you. Uh, I would say that, that God is hardwired into us that that is, that is a praise response. So even if you don't do it at church, you do it when you praise. You go listen to your favorite band, your hands go up. You go watch your favorite team score, uh, uh, the winning goal, touchdown, basket. Woo! It's a natural response of excitement for the victory that just happened. And so when we're here on a Sunday morning and we're singing and and people are like, yeah, I'm not telling you you have to do that. I'm telling you that's why they're doing that. That what's happening is it's a praise response to the goodness of who God is and that he has saved us and brought us into relationship with himself, that we were dead and now we're alive and we have a life more abundant and with him. And so uh, it's, it's people going like, yay, God. And that's what we see right here. We see that they make it through. God takes the, the, the army that is pursuing them and, and wipes them out and their response is, then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. And I love it. You know that, that songs can help you learn things for most people. <laughs> if you know me, you know I can't remember the words to any song ever. I've actually written some songs that I can't remember the words to. So I'm a special um, kind of person when it comes to that. So, but, but most of you, I mean, my wife, Brianna, she can listen to a song once and the next time she's singing with it. Um, I can listen to it a hundred times and I'm making up words the hundred and one first time. So some of you are like, worship goes on. You hear the first so- like, note that they're playing in the morning and you close your eyes and sing the rest of it. I'm this guy. 
Or like I, I read the line as fast as I can to get ahead of it and then close my eyes as I just sing the rest of that line and then I'm back and then I'm here and then I'm back. So, but there's something about songs because that, that's why things like the ABCs are in a song. Because it, it's a great tool for learning. So in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, a lot of the ways they would pass on information is by song. And so awesome things like doctrine and theology, understanding who God is, it was, was passed on through songs. And so here we see this, this amazing response, and it's this praise song to God, but they're actually talking about what he just did so that it'll help get passed on. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers, officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to, sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the generations of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. There's some cool lines in this song, by the way. <laughs> by, listen to this. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them, I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them, but you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. I just messed that up. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as a stone until your people pass by, Lord. Until... The people you brought, or you bought, excuse me, you redeemed, passed by. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. The Lord reigns forever and ever. Dang. And when they say it, there's this, there's this song of the, the listen to this, they're, they're saying, God, you were so powerful. We just saw it. Here's what we just witnessed. And it was miraculous and amazing. And you are our God and there is none like you. And there's this promise statement at the end of, and you're going to take us all the way to the promise. For you are good and sovereign and you reign forever and ever. Then it says, when Pharaoh's horses, chariots, horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them, but the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. It's just another reminder statement. And then you got to see this. This is what I love. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a trimble or tambourine in her hand. And all the women, this is great, followed her with tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang to them, and then what it does is it quotes the first line of the song that was just sang. So what that means is, this is what happened. Moses and all the Israelites, it says, sang this song, this powerful song that I just read to you. You could feel the power even without the, the, the tune of it. That, that it's this awesome song. And then what happens is Aaron's sister, Miriam, the, the, the prophet, gathers all the women and it's like time to one up what just happened. They're like, that was great and everything. Grab the music, let's start dancing, and sing that same song again. Okay, did you just catch what I said? <laughs> the men sing the songs like, yeah, 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 and God reigns forever. And the women are like, let's get it. <laughs> and they start the same song. Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver. He is hurled into the sea. And the Bible doesn't have us go through the whole song again, but you can tell that's what's happening. That, hey, like... 
Again from the top. This time, ladies, you lead us. I needed this prop just for this. But, but, but it's this awesome thing of like, yeah, we're going to sing his praise. And we're not done yet. Add the music. Let's get our bodies moving. God is so awesome. Okay. There's protection. There's the proper response to seeing God's hand move. There's the praise that we just read and, and saw. And then there's the provision. Say provision. So after the, the cross of the Red Sea, after there's this awesome praise time and the singing of God's goodness that, that, that goes on, they travel to the desert of Shur, and, and they're traveling in this desert for, for three days without water. Like three days without water is already bad. They're in a desert traveling. And they don't have water, and they come to this place called Mara, and in Mara they find water, but the problem with Mara is that the water, they get it, and it's not suitable to drink because the Bible says it's bitter. So they've come to what appears to be good and life-giving, but it actually um, is not something that they can consume. And, and so what happens is uh, the Israelites do what the Israelites like to do when they have any sort of problem come up. They grumble against Moses. So, so the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? This is a lot of people to have mad at you or frustrated with you. They didn't just ask politely, the Bible doesn't say. What should we drink? But this is they grumbled. It's like this subtle complaining that rumbles through the camp against Moses. What are we going to drink? And then God is so awesome. Um, Moses cries out to God, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, or your Bible might say a log or a tree, and he has him take it and throw it into the water that's not drinkable. He does this miraculous thing um, where it makes all the water drinkable, and in some translations it says sweet, which is very cool that the water goes from bitter to sweet. But they've, they've complained to Moses. Moses cries out to God. God comes through to show again that even when you, you, you show up to these, like, I have you. You show up to an issue that seems like an issue. I have you. When are you going to believe that you're going to be okay and not have to grumble about it? I have you. I'm your God. I'm a good God. I didn't bring you out here to die, but to take you to the promise. And so then the Lord... It says in, in, in chapter 15, starting in verse 25, about halfway through verse 25, it says, there the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you, or I am the Lord your healer. God has already protected them from all of the, the plagues that came on Egypt. He, he has kept them under the umbrella of his grace, mercy, and strength. That he has, has shown his strength against the Egyptians that are coming after him and protected his people, the Israelites. And here he says, if you continue with me, it's interesting because we read it and go like, oh man, God just gave him the longest list ever. It's a do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and then I'll take care of you. And so it seems like God doesn't really want to. That's not what's going on here. It's similar in the New Testament where it says, uh, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then all these things will be added to you. It's because the things that you're looking for are found in him, not somewhere else. So he's saying, if you believe in me, if you really trust me, then you're going you're gonna to follow what I say. Like, you're going to walk with me and listen to what's going, what my commands are, my decrees, and, and you're going to be interested in that, and you're going to believe the one, things that I've told you to do are for your good because I'm a good God who takes care of you. And in that covering of walking with me, I'm protecting you from all of the other things outside of walking with me. Okay. So he gives them this ruling instruction, this, this test, and then from there he takes them to this new place called Elam where there's 12 springs. And there's, it's interesting, it says there's 12 springs for water, which 
you know, a spring can produce a lot of water, which is good because we're talking like 2 million people plus their animals. And it says there's 70 palm trees. I'm not really sure why we needed to know that. It's awesome. Um, but 70 palm trees doesn't seem to cover very many people. So I don't know how you rotate through who gets to be under the palm trees, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but, but so God just shows again, listen, not only do I uh, make the bitter sweet as I provide for you, but, but you're complaining and you don't have the big picture in mind. You're complaining about the right now. This is just a little pit stop while I'm taking you to the place where there is more than enough for what you need. Okay, that's a good word. So that he's provided for water for them and then where we pick up and where we'll spend the rest of our time is in chapter 16 of Exodus where the people now are getting hungry. And verse one through three goes like this. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and, and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. So we're only a month and a half into this thing. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Here we go again. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, exclamation point. <laughs> God has saved them from this, this massive oppression and slavery. People that don't like them, want the worst for them, only want them for the labor that they provide. God has saved them from that. And right now they're saying, we would rather be dead by you back there than led by you right here. Dead by you back there than led by you right here. Huh. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. They said this to Moses and Aaron. And here's the Lord's instruction. The Lord is very patient with the people that are in all this. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So God says, they're hungry, they're complaining. I'm going to provide for them. I'm going to rain down bread from heaven. And they have to gather it every day, except for on the sixth day, they need to gather twice as much um, because on the seventh day, I'm resting, and so should they. That they should go out and gather enough for the next day also. And so Moses and Aaron tell the people uh, that the Lord has heard your grumbling. I love it. They're grumbling against Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron tell the people, the Lord has heard you grumbling against him. It's a, great, it's a great leadership rule right there. They, they just point right past himself. I think, I think you were saying you had a problem with God. I just want to make sure. The Lord will show you in the evening with meat to eat, in the morning with all the bread you want, that, that he's God, that he's got you. You are not grumbling against us, but God. While Aaron was speaking... God told him to, to, to draw near to God. Aaron's speaking to the people, telling them that this bread's going to come, that he's going to provide meat in the evening, bread in the morning. And while he's talking to them, the whole community looked to the desert and saw the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. And the Lord says to Moses, tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. This is interesting. Um, as I read through this several times this week, getting ready to teach it, um, it doesn't say clearly exactly how that conversation goes with Moses. It comes right on the back end of saying the people looked out to the desert and saw the glory of God. They're like, okay, God's right there, and it's very clear right now. And then the next line is, the Lord said to Moses, tell them. So I don't know how that played out. I don't know if Moses had to like get away from the people for a minute, because it seems like it happened right then. They looked out there, and then God says to Moses, hey, tell them that they're going to get meat, they're going to get bread, and they're going to know that, that I'm their God. And so when I was working through it this, this week, again, I don't know if he went 
off with God alone, or if, I don't know if Moses was still with the people when this happened. Moses and Aaron are there talking to the community of people. It says they look out and see the glory of God and that the Lord speaks to Moses. You ever been in a conversation where somebody's there that you don't really want to talk to? So you tell somebody else to tell them something even though they're standing there? Right? Like you look to your spouse and you're like, hey, tell your kid that if they don't clean their room right now, they're not going to see their next birthday. <laughs> it's one possibility on how God speaks to them here because it, it clearly is they see the Lord and the next line is God speaks to Moses about them. And, and so I don't know, like I said, I don't know if that was a separate thing or if they're, if they're standing there. But if they are standing there and hear God say that to him, that's awesome. Hey, why don't you just tell them, I'm going to take care of this and show that I'm their God. So quail came that evening. That night, quail comes in. And then dew in the morning. And when the dew was gone in the morning, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared, which I think is interesting because I think they just said manna is frosted flakes. I'm not positive. (laughs) Thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared. What is it, they said. And Moses said, it is the bread the Lord has given you. Then they had to go gather it. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. It says where they gathered what they thought was too much or not enough. Once they got home, it was just what they needed. And God had made it clear that don't keep any of it for the next day. Every morning, you go get your daily bread. And it won't stay till the next day, except for on the sixth day because I've ordained that you rest that day. And so that day only during the week, it'll, it'll stay till the next day. You need to gather twice as much. Go get your daily bread. I love it. There's this miraculous thing that God does, and they still had to go gather their miracle in. God says, I'm going to do this miraculous thing. I'm providing all this. Now go get your miracle and bring it in. And then he wants them to be, understand the dependence that they have on him and not themselves. And so don't gather a bunch of it. Tomorrow, wake up. Remember that it's all about me. I'm going to show you again that I'm your provider. I need to drill it home every single morning. I am your God and you are my people. Go get it again. Go get it again. We need that kind of reminder. We need the constant renewing of our minds. Remembering who he is and who we are in view of who he is as his sons and daughters. Our daily bread that they would go get in. Some people wanted to just test that, and so they gathered too much and, and, and brought it in. The Bible says the next day when they woke up, it was filled with maggots and started to stink. God's got, God goes, you to thinking you can do it on your own, look what it provides. On the sixth day, they gather twice as much so that on the seventh day, it, it doesn't go bad over that night. It's good in the morning. And some people still go out on that morning looking for it and realize, oh, wait, I should have listened. Listen, there's there's none out here. And God is establishing the Sabbath. He says, I rest, rest on the seventh day. You're to rest from your work. In fact, I don't even want you to go gather your food. I want you to have it there that you would just spend time with me and with the people. Hmm. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It goes down to list kind of what it was like, like a a wafer with honey. It's interesting because the word manna seems like so deep. Because like, oh, it's manna, it's this miraculous thing. Uh, You know, manna sounds like the words for what is it? That's what it's called. Could you imagine going to the store and picking up a loaf of what is it? It's, a, it's an amazing thing because of the one who provided it. That he, he, he gave them what would sustain them, that they would come to him daily and he would sustain them by his daily bread. That they would understand a dependence on him, understand the covering, the love, that, that he is their provider. And that every day they would see he provides. That every day they had to wake up and go like, 
man, I hope God provided again today because yesterday's isn't going to cut it anymore. So today I need to wake up dependent on him and go, go seek what he has provided. And I love this. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it, keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar, put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. So God is, so listen, every day the manna is a miraculous thing. And it's a, it's a thing that only lasts for that day. On the sixth day, going to the seventh day, there's this another, uh, like another miraculous thing that happens with it. It lasts longer. Now, this special stuff that goes in the jar is going to remain before the Lord, and it's just going to keep lasting without having maggots or getting stinky. And the purpose of it is to keep, to show the generations in the future the provision of God that happened for their ancestors, for the generation before them, that they depended on God, relied on God, that God showed himself to be good every single day. I am a good God. I care. I'm here. I listen. I provide. I'm with you. And can, can I say that, that we need to get good at that? You know why a lot of generations don't keep on with God? It's because what they know is that you have a headspace to want to go to church. You have a book that sits on the table, but, but it, it's about saying like, no, I know my God. I've walked with him, and here's what he's done in my life. The testimony of God's goodness in our life on a personal level is what transforms and passes on to our kids. It's not I heard about a God. It's like, look at this jar of what God did. Like, look, he's real to me. He transforms everything about me as I understand who he is and who I am. I've, I've become one of his own. And son, daughter, maybe it's not by blood. Maybe it's somebody you get to disciple and mentor because we're all called to make disciples. So come alongside me. Maybe you haven't seen God in these ways, but I need to show you so that, so that my faith and that, that it was grown by this moment can, can rub off on you and you can have some faith growth because of what God's done in me. Oh, man. We need to get good at that. But constantly in Scripture, we see bad examples of it. We also see some good examples, and here it says, to keep this for the generations to come. What, do, what are we doing? It's, it's not enough to just play church and think that's going to um, get your kids excited about Jesus. Listen, we're going to do our darndest in the children's ministry. By the grace of God, he's going to save little souls at a young age. But our job is to partner with you as their family. Partner. I want to end by talking about the better bread than manna. See, there's this time in Scripture where Jesus takes little, breaks it, and makes it enough to feed 5,000 plus. 5,000 just men, not counting women and children. So there's all these people that get fed. And then after they're, they're fed, they, they gather what's left, and there's still more. It's this huge provisional miracle. And, and the, the people are there, and... and Jesus sends his guys away in these boats and then he stays and he prays and then Jesus does this thing, maybe you've heard of it, he walks on water out to his disciples and they get to the other side of the lake and when they get over there, um, the people from where he left realize, wait, Jesus isn't here anymore. Let's go find him. You know, there's the 5,000 plus women and children. There's lots of people realize he's not there so they hop in the boats and they, they, they race over to see Jesus and, and when they get there, um, they show up and they're seeking Jesus and, and Jesus tells them, you're not here because you saw a sign. You're here because I gave you bread. Like Jesus straight up says like, you came to find me again because I fed you, not because you understand that I'm the Messiah. 
Like me sustaining just your physical body isn't enough. You have to believe in who I am. And so they ask, like, what does it mean to do the work of God so that we're good? And he says, the work of God is to believe in me. He's trying to drill down on them. You want all the outside stuff. You want the, 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 just the tangible bread for you to eat. You want to do some sort of work so that you can feel like you're right with God. He says, listen, the work of God is to believe in me. And they say, right here, starting in, in chapter 6 of John, starting verse 30, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? They're like, great, you want us to believe that you're the Messiah. Do something. <laughs> he just fed them with like barely any food, fed thousands and thousands of people. They don't realize that he walked on water on the way out. They probably wouldn't ask him this question. What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. They're referencing back to what we're talking about today. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father, my father, who gives you the true bread from heaven. The true bread from heaven. He's saying like, okay, God gave some bread before the true bread from heaven is, is this, it's an eternal spiritual bread. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. It's an interesting statement. Give us that and keep giving it to us. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. So he's saying there's a, a deeper sustaining power. There's life that's given and, and there's sustaining there's this, this salvation and sustaining that happens in Christ. He says, you're coming for this ex exterior, this, this, this tangible, this bread to eat. I'm the bread from heaven that brings life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. He's continuing to try to say what the, the big issue is here. You guys are talking about all these things, and the issue is, do you believe in Jesus? That he is the Christ, the Messiah, the one that we put our faith in. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. This is an amazing statement. Whoever the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. That when we, when we come to Christ, he's not pushing us back, but receiving us in. For I have not come down from heaven, excuse me, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up the last day. This is amazing. That as we read this phenomenal story of God's provision in the Old Testament for his people in the desert of providing bread, providing the manna for them, that we have a, a, a greater bread, a greater miracle that, that we receive in Christ Jesus that has come down from heaven, that when we put our faith, our trust in him, in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that we are saved and sustained on a much deeper level than just some food from the cupboard. But that we have been given a right standing, a right relationship with Almighty God, the one who stretches out his hand and is powerful over everything, 
that is sovereign over everything and as a part of his plan has decided to draw us to himself, that he wants a relationship with us. In fact, he wants it so greatly that knowing that we can't make it right on our own, he provided the way in Jesus Christ that we could start a relationship with God in Christ. Not in our own works, but in the finished work that Jesus took all of our sins on the cross, that when we put our faith in that, we receive his righteousness. He takes our sin, gives us his righteousness, that the old us is dead and gone, the new us is here. We are a new creation in Jesus Christ. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's amazing. This is what I want to do. I want to pray for us. Um, in fact, could you stand with me as the worship team comes up? We're going to get towards that response space. You do not get to borrow the tambourine as we do this. Because I will be using it. Okay. But this is, this is what this is. This is us realizing, man, God has saved us through a miraculous way. Through sending Jesus to live this, the perfect life that I cannot live. That die for our sins. Redeem our lives. And that our proper response is to praise him. To sing of his goodness. So that's what we're going to do. So listen, this is not uh, being dismissed yet. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to pray. Then we're going to sing of God's goodness. As we sing of God's goodness, we're going to have some prayer partners on the side. If you need prayer for anything, they would love to pray with you. After we sing for a moment, Casey's going to come up here. And Casey's going to talk to you about uh, some, real, some real personal ways of response to what God might be doing in your heart today. Just making sure we're identifying, okay, God, you're doing something, and I don't want to leave here and forget or not be a part of what you're drawing me to. And so don't go running off. The kids are doing great in their classrooms. I believe that's a faith statement. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing of God's goodness, but don't go running off. God, we thank you. We thank you. God, we thank you for the love, the compassion, the mercy, the grace, the power, the strength that you show. God, as we look at your mighty hand moving in, in, in the people, God, in your interaction with Moses and the saving uh, of Israel, God, as we see Christ talk about it in the New Testament that, that he is our Savior, that he is the bread of life, God, that we would understand that and we would not turn to other things to sustain us, God, but we would understand that the saving power is in Christ, the sustaining power is in Christ. The sanctifying work happens through you, Lord God. And we sing of, of what you have already done, what you continue to do, and what you will do on the day that we are with you forever. God, we just, we're grateful in this, this, this place. God, I thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, that, that when we see you move with those miraculous and mighty ways. God, you still move in those ways. God, we cry out to you to move in those spaces. God, maybe there's something we're struggling with, we're wrestling through. Maybe there's a, a sin issue in our life, Lord God, that, that we need you to move in mighty and powerful ways. Maybe there's a relationship that, that, God, whether our own doing or someone else's doing is broken, God, and, and we need you to move in mighty and miraculous ways. God, because of the the brokenness of, the, of this world, God, our bodies get into broken spaces. And God, we ask that you move in powerful ways. God, I thank you that you're just reassuring us through all of this, that you are a protector, that you deserve our praise, that you are a provider, Lord God, that you take care of your people. God, that in all of it, you have the outcomes. Those are up to you, but God, you have called us to obedience, to walk with you, to follow with you. God, knowing that we won't do it perfectly, that, that our faith is in the perfect work of Christ, but God, that you are doing a perfecting work in us to make us more like Christ. God, I ask that there would be transformed hearts and lives in this space today. I know that your word is powerful, that is active, that is alive. God, we thank you for this. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name.